It was almost exactly three years ago that I preached my first sermon in this pulpit. In fact, I, we have a three-year lectionary, so I missed by two weeks having the same readings assigned today as I did for my first sermon here, and I seriously considered changing the readings just so I could do that. But since that first sermon, we've done a lot together as a church. Uh, Personally, we've had some fairly significant things like the birth of my son. Uh, We've moved twice, moving in for the first time and then having to move on very short notice. And the church was amazing in coming together to help us do that. We've said goodbye to our previous rector and said hello to a new one. We've seen the children's ministry expand into three classes. We've welcomed two groups of teenagers who made adult decisions in confirmation. We've worked together to run three successful sports camp uh, in which over 200 children have in one way or another heard about Jesus, many of whom for the very first time. We've taken some steps as a congregation uh, outward to begin taking very seriously the role uh, that we need to have in evangelistic mission as a congregation. And as I've been reflecting on the past three years, I keep coming back to one of my favorite roles here at Epiphany. As your associate minister for discipleship and now your associate rector, I've been given the chance to learn and grow and develop as a teacher. And it's been one of my favorite parts of being here. As an associate, I've gotten to preach a lot more than many associates get to. I don't know if you know this, but I teach each week um, in one form or another about two to four different groups of people, whether it's youth group or children or preaching or something like that. And I've been given the chance to do uh, two Wednesday night uh, classes, uh, two four-week series, which have been definitely among the highlights of and some of my favorite things that I've gotten to do here. I have loved and been humbled by the privilege of serving as one of the teachers in this congregation of all ages, rising kindergartners and on up. So as one of this congregation's teachers, I think that James's words read this morning are a fitting way uh, to end my role as preacher and teacher in this congregation. So if you would, turn with me to James chapter 1, which is page 1011 in the Blue Pew Bibles. James chapter 1. <coughs> James writes to Christians who have already been taught the faith. They know Jesus and they trust in him. So he writes to them as one of their teachers that uh, writing to a group that has already been taught at least the basics. So as one of his teachers, he writes this beginning in verse 22. Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who intent, looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he is like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Don't be one who listens to the word and then goes away forgetting what you've just heard. Be a doer of the word, one who puts into practice what the Bible teaches. Don't just attend a Wednesday night class on how to interpret the Bible. Read the Bible and interpret it. Don't just attend a class on Christian virtue act virtuously, put into practice what we've learned together. Okay, James, that's very interesting, but what does being a doer of the word look like? And that, he knows in advance, is a good question, and he tells us something very significant about what that would look like. Look at verse 27. 
religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, do you know what visiting widows and orphans in their affliction means? After careful linguistic study of the original Greek and the potential Aramaic behind it, do you know what scholars have come up with? Visit widows and orphans in their affliction. Widows and orphans were the most unprotected members of society. They had no standing, they had no protection, they had no legal right to own property, they were the most underprivileged and disadvantaged people in society. And James says, if you want to live out Christianity in a way that God accepts, if you want to do this the way God will be with a, in a way with which God will be pleased, care for them. Care for the lowly and the lowest of the low in society. We are not saved because we care for the poor or the disadvantaged. We are saved through God's grace, which we receive through faith. But as those who trust in Jesus, then we must act that out. We must be doers of the word. We must do what God expects from his people. Care for the poor and the oppressed, the neglected, and the despised of the world. And as our psalm reading for today says, that's the kind of God that we serve. He looks out for the poor and the oppressed and the widow and the orphan. I recently met a young man who just graduated from college and I was very impressed with him right away. He's now working in, a, in the inner city of a major US city. And he's working directly, this is, he's about something like three or four months out of college. And what he's given his life to right now is he's working in the inner city with men who have turned to prostitution in order to survive. Talk about caring for the poor, oppressed, neglected, and despised of the world. This young man is ministering in Jesus' name to men in terrible circumstances. But I can think of little that one could do with one's life that is more obviously doing the word of God, putting into practice what God expects Christians to do, putting into practice what the Bible teaches us to do. Now, not everyone is called to move to the inner city to work with men in, survi in survival prostitution, but we are all, all, expected to care for the abused and the oppressed and the underprivileged in the world. If you want to live in the way that Jesus expects, this needs to be a top priority for you. Find ways that you can actively and intentionally care for the lowly. As one writer put it, those who suffer from want in the two-thirds world, in the inner city, those who are unemployed and penniless, those who are inadequately represented in government or in law, and I will add, those who are being killed before they are ever born. These are the people who should see abundant evidence of Christians' pure religion. These are the people who should see abundant evidence of Christians' pure religion. As one of your teachers, allow me to challenge you to identify ways that you personally can participate in caring for the disadvantaged. We do a lot of things in our congregation surrounding this. Donate to the Coates food bags when they start back up very soon. Our outreach and evangelism committee has numerous ways throughout the year uh, to give to the needy. Keep your eyes open for those opportunities and participate. Go out of your way to find ways to, f to help hurting people and love them and provide for them in Jesus' name. Sponsor children through Compassion International or World Vision. Give generously to organizations like the International Justice Mission. 
Go on a short-term mission trip to another part of the world and get to know personally people who are suffering. Give the gifts that you have in your business for free to those who otherwise couldn't afford it but are in need. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. But James doesn't stop there. Doing the word involves what we could call social action, visiting widows and orphans in their affliction and taking care of the oppressed and disadvantaged. But look at the second half of that verse. It also involves keeping oneself unstained from the world. We could call that moral action. James is concerned that if Christians do not adequately put the teaching of the Bible into practice, then a pollution from the world will get into the hearts and minds of Christians. And James has a lot to say about this pollution in, the, in his letter. He says that friendship with the world is enmity with God, chapter 4, verse 4. Worldliness in the church includes neglecting the poor, chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Worldliness includes an uncontrolled tongue, chapter 3. Worldliness includes so-called wisdom, which is actually earthly, unspiritual, and demonic, chapter 3, verse 15. Worldliness includes double-mindedness towards God that limits prayer, chapter 1, verse 8. He has a lot to say about the potential pollution from worldliness. And avoiding worldliness means doing the word of God, putting into practice, putting into moral action what we are taught to do. Now we can keep ourselves unstained from the world by sort of hedging ourselves in and not touching the big bad world out there. And to be fair, sometimes we do need to do something like that in certain sorts of situations. For example, I hear this message more and more and more just any time you turn on the TV these days. Um, the world tells us that all dating relationships must necessarily involve sleeping together. I've talked with single adults and they say the message is just as clear in that context as it is for teenagers. And keeping oneself unstained by the world will mean having nothing to do with that pathetic standard that the world offers us and instead honoring God by reserving sexual expression only to a marriage between a man and a woman. Let the reader understand. Sometimes remaining unstained by the world means removing ourselves from situations so that we do not sin like the world does. On the other side, on the other hand, sometimes keeping ourselves unstained from the world means following Jesus' example of getting right smack in the middle of the fallen and broken world, coming face to face with the fallenness and darkness of the world and bringing the light of Jesus into the world, clothed with, as we talked about last week, God's own armor to protect us from the sin and fallenness of the world. If you will, the best defense is a good offense. I got a picture of this recently with my son, Caleb. When I come home from work, Caleb often just runs right up and gives me a hug. And I love it because it's often where I get the best hugs of the day. The problem is that when I come in, he often just stops whatever he was doing and charges at me. Now that could, have mean, could mean he just got up from snack and he has snack all over everything as he charges at me or as happened recently when I came home wearing my you know nice clergy costume with black pants and everything and he was out playing with sidewalk chalk and here comes this pink green blue mass charging at me now if I'm not careful my clothes will get polluted by what's on his hands now I could keep myself unpolluted from my son by not coming home or by jump running up the stairs quickly before he can catch me. I am quicker than he is at this point. Or 
I could come face to face with the pollution and clean off his hands and then get my hug. <laughs> now, coming face to face with the pollution of the world is messier, but we can actually bring Jesus into it when we do so. James is concerned that the world is getting into the church, while in fact, if you will, the, world, the, the church is supposed to get into the world. Acts 17.6. It's one of my favorite verses, and I, I really do believe that, in some sense, this should be the mission statement of all churches in the country, and it would make me very happy if someone heard this and decided to make it their vision statement for all churches in the United States or in the world. Acts 17.6, the disciples are, um, some of the leaders are getting mad at the disciples, and so they can't find the disciples, so they find the people that uh, are letting the disciples stay in their house. And they drag them before the courts, and they accuse, point their fingers at these people, and they accuse them of being people who have come to our town, and they've been turning the world upside down. And now they've come here. That's the accusation that these people have. These people have been turning the world upside down in Jesus' name. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the disciples were accused of doing. Instead of being stained by the world, we're supposed to, if you will, stain the world with what we've been given, the message and love and truth of Jesus. When Jesus' followers and the world collide, which direction is the contagion supposed to travel? Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I think James's words are a fitting way for me to leave the pulpit and teaching ministry at Epiphany. Together we've read the Bible, we've heard the word of God, we've studied it together, and now the call is to continue to put into practice what we've learned. None of us knows everything there is to know from the Bible. As one of my seminary professors used to joke, no matter how long he'd been studying the Bible and teaching it for 30 plus years, he was still convinced when he was sleeping, the Holy Spirit went and added new verses he'd never noticed before. <laughs> None of us understands anything close to all that the Bible has to teach us. But all of us are expected to put into practice what we do know. James 1.27 is abundantly clear. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Care for the helpless and the oppressed in this society. Visit the orphans and widows that we have in our society. Practice Christian virtue and godly living, especially in those areas where our culture tells us to do otherwise. Change the world as the disciples did, being filled with the Holy Spirit and coming face to face with the pollution of the world and bringing the message and love of Jesus right into the middle of it and seeing God do incredible things as a result. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To close, I want to close with the collect from last week because it fits our topic so well. So to close, let's pray. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, Increase in us true religion. Nourish us with all goodness. And bring forth in us the fruit of good works. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.